You have asked three questions. One is how to do successful large-scale digital transformation. Second is what's happening in AI. And the third one, what would future of work look like for students of policy would. Now, the citizens expect governments also to come up to the same level of maturity which exists in the private sector in terms of technology service delivery. What is called Jam Trinity, so yes. which is your bank account, Jandan, your Aadhaar and your mobile. So all three put together can actually pinpoint an individual and his or her family. So you need two, three things for a successful large-scale digital transformation. You need a vision, you need the will to deliver, you need policy support. And finally, you want to create the whole system. I wrote my first AI program on MATLAB and it was digit recognition. How do you ensure that people get a fair treatment everywhere by everyone using AI? Namaskar Santosh Ji. Namaskar. Welcome to Rishi Odi University. I would like to say thanks to you to coming to Rishi Odi University and addressing our delegates for Policy Bootcamp 2024. I would like to know from a very successful IS officer, how did he implement the e-governance policy in Tamil Nadu? Also, I would like to ask you about your doctorate on the AI, which is the raging topic right now in the world. Also, I would like to get some insights from you and your guidance for our policy bootcamp students, what are the different ways to come into the policy space? You've asked three questions. One is how to do successful large scale uh, digital transformations. Second is what's happening in AI and talk about a little bit about what work I did in my PhD thesis. And the third one is what would future of work look like for students of policy bootcamp? Yes. So I'll try to answer all three. So first one is of course, I think technology is, is really rapidly encircling all of us so whether we like it or not but technology is something which is which is just touching every aspect of our lives today so from shopping which is and i'm not meaning shopping in malls i'm shopping in in at a at a roadside shop at a sabji uh, wala or uh, or even at a, a small chai wala where you have to have access to digital payment systems. If you're ordering something today, you need to access uh, digital systems to get your uh, food, get your grocery, your medicine, particularly in the city and urban areas. And I was very surprised. I come from a village and uh, very recently when I went there, I saw the, the youngsters there, every day an amazing delivery comes there. This is interior, deep interior. So technology is, is just touching all of us. And I think uh, as we get more and more private sector services, uh, we, we get dependent on them, whether it is recharging your mobile, uh, whether it is paying your electricity bill, uh, whether it is ordering, uh, uh, buying something online. Now, the citizens expect governments also to come up to the same level of maturity which exists in the private sector in terms of technology service delivery. And that's where I think the lot of scope and excitement in government is also to try and deliver those services in a very, very hyper-personalized way. So if you do, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give a shopping example again. If you have shopped for a particular type of books, Next time when you go to that app, it actually suggests you some of those books. So it knows what is your interest. Like Netflix, I think they were one of the, you know, pioneers in uh, giving personalized, hyper-personalized suggestions. And I think the government also going forward uh, is going to, many of them are already doing it. Why can't, because now you have a, very what is called jam trinity so yes. which is your uh, bank account jandan your aadhaar and your mobile so all three put together can actually pinpoint pinpoint an individual and his or her family right. and the government knows what all eligibilities a person has and they can actually deliver those services without the person needing to ask and i think that has been the uh, thrust of e-governance systems around the country i would say and I think, of course, we are at various stages of maturity. So first is to have that vision and to have that commitment that we want to go there and we want to deliver uh, services where citizens 
can access it in an inclusive way. So you don't create uh, digital barriers. And, and, and good thing is I'll bring in AI also here because AI comes in and helps bridge that digital barrier. Because without AI, you have to rely on keyboard and which is not necessarily the most uh, efficient interacting interface with the digital system, particularly for the population which is of my generation and older. And remember, we are talking about not very uh, tech savvy urban population. We are talking about huge rural population. We are talking about elderly people, ladies, uh, farmers, laborers, workers, uh, semi-literates. So you have to design an interface which is inclusive and AI brings that ability. So you can actually speak into a system and have that system perform what you want to perform. So like you have Alexa, you have Siri, you have all those things coming up. You have chat GPT 4.0, which is a great conversational uh, agent. Actually, it understands what you're saying in a, in a true conversational sense. At least that's a demo video which shows it to have. So if you had an interface like that, people could actually go and speak and say that this is what I need or this is what I'm feeling. This is uh, what I uh, want information about and all those can be delivered according to the need, context and the localization of an individual or the family. So that's a very powerful transformative tool. So you need two, three things for a successful large scale digital transformation. One is of course, you need a vision, you need the will to deliver, and of course you need policy support. So, uh, uh, and finally you also need funds to create the whole system. It requires taking along a lot of stakeholders. It requires taking along your existing human resources. It requires change management. It requires uh, support from, uh, from uh, all the three pillars of governance, which is your judiciary, your legislature and executive. So this is, is key to delivering any large transformation in e-governance. So that's topic one. So you would like to like talk about the EPAR project and if AI would have helped you in EPAR, how it would have been different? Right. So it's EPARVAI and PARVAI in Tamil means vision. And uh, the idea was how do you screen for cataract? a large population. So that was the question, the problem we were trying to solve. So while uh, cataract surgery is is not a very difficult surgery to do, in fact, you discharge people in a couple of hours, very easy to do. But the challenge is how do you screen and find out who are the people who are affected with cataract and you have to screen a large population. You can't have, uh, it's impossible to send vans or doctors or medical teams, optometrists and ophthalmologists to every single village or uh, urban locality. So that was the challenge we were trying to solve and we uh, tried, attempted to build an app uh, uh, using AI, uh, computer vision technology in fact, which when an eye, a picture is clicked, it runs an algorithm on it. It is basically, it's a supervised learning. It's, uh, it's trained on equal positive and negative data. So there's a uh, good amount of training which is done prior to actually launching it and then when you take it to the field then you click a picture of an eye and it's supposed to based on the previous experience and labeled images it says that this classifies that image into two categories whether there's a cataract or not a cataract. when i say cataract it means potential cataract so you don't decide whether it is a cataract based on that application but it's just primary screening tool you bring the patient to the hospital. So you, out of say 100 people you screened, you found out five such people. You bring all five to the hospital. And then of course the trained ophthalmologist and all does the examination and decides what's the right course of action for them. So this became a very, very important tool in screening a large population. In India, almost 5 million people go blind every year. And out two thirds of that is preventable. And that's because of advanced stages of cataract. So that was the solution uh, we tried to build and uh, it got launched in several districts. Uh, in fact, I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, last year, I came across a, a Harvard Business Review case study on this. Uh, a Harvard case study, not Harvard Business Review. It's a Harvard case study. Uh, in fact, I've, uh, I, I, I got a copy of it. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, and, and the whole idea is how, how does technology help in such kind of uh, social problem. So that was the uh, the whole 
construct of uh, epar why yeah. we called it epar so so moving on to our next question right again ai and you are thesis on ai right how does it this of course this work got started uh, long time ago when ai was not so popular i mean ai was popular but but it was not such a common household Household name name which as it has become i started uh, in 2017 looking at ai and uh, my brush with ai came because uh, long time ago there, there used to be something called genetic algorithms i don't know if you have heard of them uh, when i was doing my graduation from iit kanpur that time uh, there was this uh, uh, thing called genetic algorithm and they were supposed to be they were mimicking genes of a human system and trying to build intelligence and trying to solve problems using gene mutation like the way gene mutation happens and that was called genetic algorithms so i had worked there so ai was when when i started looking at ai it was of of great interest in fact the first uh, course i did on ai and i I did it on uh, not on Python because Python was just becoming more popular. Uh, it was on uh, MATLAB. MATLAB. Okay. So I wrote my first uh, AI program on MATLAB, and it was digit recognition. When I saw how simple it is, uh, it's a simple application of linear algebra. Okay. It really struck me as. this is a transformational technology and i think we have uh, this this has really uh, it's very powerful and of course i started got interested luckily uh, uh, registered for my phd also from uh, i am rai for and uh, the idea was how our governments prepared to handle ai i mean that was the whole problem we were trying to address at least that's what my intention was and if governments need to prepare for it how do they need to prepare for it and if governments are going to benefit so one is governments have two roles to play in ai one as a user of ai so they have to be user of ai because lot of like i talked about e par so like there are so many applications which are possible for public good uh, you know uh, you can detect uh, stunting or malnourishment in children you can use it for diagnosis because there is always perpetual shortage of uh, doctors uh, for example neurologists and if you have the system you can actually do a primary screening of your uh, mri or cat scan uh, using ai and then once you realize that it is something which needs a serious look by a doctor then you take it so it can be a tool of that or it can be a tool for learning as well so education even agriculture for this is agriculture health education uh, public service delivery a lot of these so the question we sought i mean i wanted to explore was one how does government use ai and what are the areas if they want to use ai how should they go about using ai how should they go about promoting ai is it possible to use ai in every field they like is there a prerequisite which has to be done before it can be popularized i mean you you don't get into a, a car without having a driving license so is there a driving license required and if that is required what kind of driving license is required and what is the preparatory work which has to be done before you can get a driving license so that was one aspect of it second aspect of it government is also a regulator so when everybody starts using ai how do you ensure that it is not exclusionary how do you ensure that people get a fair treatment everyone by 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 everyone using ai how do you ensure even private sector might be using how uh, how do they ensure how do you ensure that the private sector is using it responsibly also it needs to promote and regulate to some extent uh, possible outcomes how do you bring certainty into that sphere when uh, ai can do so many things how do you bring some degree of certainty into innovators mind that okay if i do this these are the boundaries which i'll have to take care of so uh, so both these we were trying to uh, explore in that phd thesis so 
how do you uh, what are the challenges which exist in terms of public policy challenges what are the potential outcomes which can be detrimental to the society and at the same time if you want to promote uh, adoption of technology ai technology how do you go about doing that what are the systematic steps which you have to take to uh, achieve a good degree of adoption in multiple areas so they would definitely like to know is ai going to get them more jobs or ai going to you know kill the job and the second part of question it will be for our policy boot camp students with your experience as a is officer like what are the different ways that a uh, aspiring policy maker can get into government obviously the is is the way but are there any other avenues to get into a government i think ai is going to transform the jobs uh, which we see so and that's a regular uh, change which is happening i think uh, there was a very interesting study um, done um, 40% of the jobs which existed 10 years ago do not exist anymore so this is without ai i mean yesterday we were talking people are making reels and if their content is creator many of them make good amount of money out of that right making videos short videos making uh, uh i i th- there's a car mechanic uh who makes videos in hindi on how does how does he when the car comes in he just opens them and shows that this is a problem and this is how i'm going to fix it there's a very popular video he runs into i mean hundreds and thousands of views he's making a decent amount of money on that i was watching a video of a driver who works in one of the middle east country and he somehow makes this videos very interesting all he does is just talks about his day today i did this and today i did this i went here from here to there and that's all and he is very popular and he in his uh, videos apparently says that i make more money from the videos than i make uh, from my driving so so jobs are going to get transformed with the advent of any technology whether it is ai or non ai ai has only created a disruption because it's considered a disruptive technology it is going to do a transformation which will be much steeper than what the previous technologies have been able to but it will also create new opportunities like like always technologies have they have brought in a wave of new jobs and they have swiped away uh, uh, a wave of uh, a set of jobs uh, uh, so it's it's like uh, it's a it's a regular transition which keeps happening and ai is not different so while uh, you have to think which jobs so repetitive jobs i read somewhere which was very nicely written that uh, ai is not going to take away jobs but if you don't use ai you your job may be taken away so i think you have to use ai intelligently to make your job more interesting more uh, adapted uh, and and uh, make yourself more productive so that's the demand which is going to come if you're not using that technology you're certainly at risk if you are using that technology you will be of course riding the wave and you will probably get propelled farther and farther and so which is which is good for you so from that perspective i think uh, i'm not overly concerned about technology ai taking away a lot of jobs i mean people say that tomorrow you will have self driving cars and all the drivers will go away but of course it will it will bring in some new aspects of technology which we don't understand today so uh, while one set of jobs may go away but there might be another set of jobs which open up so for example i mean there were no jobs for uh, uh, i mean now the firms hire social media experts right i mean which never existed earlier uh, people could never make money out of you. describing their daily lives <laughs> now you can so a okay. lot of new stuff is happening so that transformation will happen from the policy perspective the career you asked whether people will have uh, a choice uh, of of careers if they study policy i think again policy field is going to be uh, rapidly evolving every day there is something new which is happening with ai so and and policy always lags innovation and uh, as new and uh, new innovations newer innovations happen i think there will be a need for 
policy to keep catching up and i think there is hopefully i think uh, there will be large number of opportunities for people who do policy work especially in these emerging technology areas so whether it is ai whether it is uh, web3 for example yeah. or which is your uh, you know bitcoin or uh, you know blockchain yeah. and, uh, and 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 we have seen the the pitfalls uh, you had seen ftx collapse you had seen 3 euro capital collapse you had seen uh, binance uh, going under uh, so lot of challenges are there when technologies are not understood not regulated well so for example dubai has just brought out a law saying that virtual uh, there any uh, virtual assets have to be backed by their own currency fiat currency so okay uh, so these kind of regulations when they are not there if these kind of policies are not there or if these kind of thoughts are not there in the policy makers mind these technologies can lead to catastrophe and that's where i think this new wave of policy enthusiasts and experts will be needed for navigating that complex technology from a policy perspective so that uh, safety inclusiveness harm to society is prevented it was really really nice talking to you sir thank you so much for coming here you're welcome thank you